We may be starting a little bit early now, but uh, people can filter in. Welcome to our response panel. Hasn't this been an incredible week and an incredible day? I think for some of us to have women's rights and civil rights all on the same day is just enough to just turn all your uh, emotional um, uh, well-being uh, around and over. And uh, I, I, is anybody, anybody else here get teary-eyed both in the morning and the afternoon? Right, right, I think we all did. Well, we have, um, as I mentioned this morning, six fabulous uh, women from the 20th century to talk to us today. Um, let's see, we're, we're missing we're missing Dickie Chappelle, but you know, she's always late. So I think we're going to go ahead without her. She's notorious for being late. And, um, and so we will begin, we will go in the order uh, that they are listed in your program. And um, then we, each of them will talk for uh, about eight minutes, and then we'll leave some time for questions to them uh, in their characters. And you know, I think it's, it takes such a tremendous amount of time, effort, work, and love to create one of these characters. And, um, but I think it's also very difficult following a presentation to maintain um, that, that, to stay inside the character. And I've been impressed by how how everyone this week has been able to do it, and we admire you and thank you ahead of time for, for your efforts. So, um, without further saying anything more, I think we've got all the ground rules. We'll try to be done by, um, by quarter to four. I know some of you have places you have to be at four. So, I will um, call first on um, Bessie Coleman, who has a remark remarkable costume and remarkable woman. Bessie, welcome. Thank you very much. I want to encourage all the women and all the members of my race to become aviators. Because only by flying can you truly be free. I became the first black woman aviator ever licensed in the entire world in 1921. And if I can do it, anyone can do it. I was born in 1892 in a small town in Texas. Growing up, I had to pick cotton, and let me tell you, I hated picking cotton. But I was a family accountant, so I made sure that none of the farmers cheated us. We always got paid for what we picked. In 1910, I entered the Colored Agricultural and Industrial College in Langston, Texas. I only got to stay there for about a year because my mother ran out of money. She really wanted us to go to school and make the most of ourselves, but without the cash, I had to go back home. But I heard about three things that really influenced me. In 1910, Ramon LaRouche of France became the first licensed woman pilot in the world. She was flying. A woman was actually flying. And then in 1911, Harriet Quimby became the first US woman to become licensed as a pilot. So we now have two women pilots. Then Eugene Bullard became the first black man to be licensed. He actually expatriated from the United States in order to become a pilot, and so he flew for the French. I wanted to be up there flying with them, and I was determined to do it. So I worked as an independent laundress, earned some money, and then I moved to Chicago in 1915 to be with my brothers. Soon after, I became a manicurist. My clients were wealthy black men and rich white gangsters, including Al Capone. <laughs> My little brother, Johnny, worked for Al Capone. Soon after, I decided that I didn't want to be a manicurist anymore because I wasn't making quite enough money, so I opened up a chili parlor and turned over my manicurist shop to my little sister, Georgia. Soon after, I had enough money saved up, and I had made the friendship of a gentleman by the name of Robert Abbott. He was the founder of the Chicago Defender, which was the black newspaper in all of America. This man was descended of slaves and was a self-made multimillionaire. And he took an interest in my dream of becoming a pilot because wouldn't that be wonderful to put on the front of his newspaper, a black woman aviator. So he supported me. I looked around for flight schools and no one would take me. Number one, I was a woman. Number two, I was black. So he said, go to France. But you have to learn French first. <laughs> so okay, I went to the Berlitz School and learned French. And anytime he would come in, I would say, Comment allez-vous aujourd'hui? 
And he's like, oh, not bad. He was amused. <laughs> so pretty soon, November of 1920 came around, and I left for France. And the first school that I went to that I was scheduled to attend was no longer taking women because two women had crashed and died. So I went to another school, and I learned how to fly. I learned how to bank, how to do a tailspin, how to do a loop-the-loop. -loop. I was really enjoying flying. And then in June of 1921, I got my license. I was the first black woman aviator in the world. I was flying. So I hooked up with a French flying ace from World War I, got some more training, and then in September of 1921, I returned to the United States, started doing demonstrations for people, talking at all the social clubs and churches, and then I realized I wasn't making enough money. Stunt flying was where all the money was being made now, barnstorming. So I went back to France in February of 22 and got some more training. I did stunt piloting in France. I flew over the Kaiser's Palace with the photographers so they could get aerial shots. I got to fly the Dornier seaplane. That was the first commercial aircraft ever built. Number of passengers, 72. So I became the first woman to fly something that big. So equipped with all of my news reels and news clippings, I returned to the United States and I started doing more talks. And I had to put my foot down a few times because some people would ask me to talk and say, blacks aren't going to be allowed at your presentation. And I'm like, if people of my race are not admitted, I'm not performing. And so they'd let the blacks in. A lot of other times, they would say the blacks have to go in through a separate door. I said, no, they get to go in through the same door as the whites. And they allowed it because they knew that the people wanted to see my performance. <coughs> I gave the public what they wanted, so they let me get away with it. Finally, I decided to go to California. This was 1923. The Coast Rubber and Tire Company, who you know as Firestone, decided to sponsor me. They bought me my first plane, a Jenny, a JN4. So there I was with my own aircraft, worth $400. <laughs> <laughs> And I started flying. There were 10,000 people waiting for me in Los Angeles. I flew out of the Santa Monica airport, and not long after takeoff, I crashed. Those 10,000 people wanted their money back. They didn't care that I had three broken ribs, that I had fractured my leg in two places. They were just upset that they didn't get their show. I headed back to Chicago to heal, and met Prince Kojo from Africa. His family had been exiled by the French. And so here he was now in the United States. I dated him for a while. And then the call of the sky came back. And I started lecturing in 1925 in May at the International Order of the Odd Fellows Hall. And by the way, did you know you used to have an Odd Fellows Hall in Spokane? So I was lecturing again, flying, enjoying myself. And then we came up with the Christmas of 25. I spent that with my sister Eloise. It was wonderful. We talked late into the night, and then I went down and started flying again in Florida. Soon, I ran into my old friend, Robert Abbott, in a restaurant. And I walked up to him and I said, thank you so much, because you're the one who got me started in this. And he took a look at my mechanic, who was going to be flying me in a few days for the May Day Festival in Jacksonville. And he said, you know, I don't like the looks of that Texan. And I said, oh, don't worry about it, Robert. And so I went on with it. On April 30th, we were flying over the jump site, and I was in the passenger seat of the plane. I was looking out, and all of a sudden, the plane went from 80 knots to 110 knots. The plane flipped. I fell 1,000 feet to my death. And in the pocket, of my jacket, they found a letter from a little girl. Because one of the few things that I really wanted to do was to influence all of the women and children and people of my race. And this letter read, Mrs. Coleman, my dear one, I am writing you to congratulate you on your brave doings. I want to be an aviatrix when I get a woman. I like to see our own race do brave things. I am going to be out there to see you jump from the airplane. I want an airplane of my own when I get a woman. Many kisses, yours, a little girl, Ruby Mae McDuffie. 
That's all I really wanted to do. If I reached the minimum of my dreams and my desires, which this was, then it was all worth it. Thank you, thank you, Jesse. Great, great woman, Project Emma. I, I believe our next guest probably would need a little assistance. Helen, would you like to uh, reach out and I will, I will help you out. We have a very, very special visitor today. And um, I think, is this, are you comfortable? Is this very good? Let me introduce to you Helen Keller. the name, 
and the ability to give that back to her that I suddenly realized there was a way for me to be in that world that I was so crazy and mad to get involved with in the first place. Um, we, uh, we went back to the Perkins Institute um, and um, it was uh, there that I <coughs> became educated and my father uh, gradually did not do very well and so he would write to me that he would take me out of the Perkins Institute and put me in the circus to be a sideshow freak so that we could earn money. Now, um, I have a terrible propensity and love of the finer things. I love lace and I love silk. So you can imagine it was my desire to work a much more genteel circuit. Um, I, I went, I, the problem, of course, with high, higher class Victorian society is that they, especially if you are a woman, they want you to behave and they want you to um, not, uh, they want you to be submissive and they want you not to have any appetites at all. And I didn't really like this very much. Um, I didn't get along with them very well, but they, they seemed to admire me, and so they supported myself and teacher, and that's how we managed to live, through their funding. Um, I did go on to Radcliffe College. I graduated cum laude. Um, teacher wanted me to graduate summa cum laude, and uh, so I disappointed her there. Um, I, I'm not a genius. Um, I'm just a normal human being. But she wanted me to be much more than I, than I really ever think I can be. Um, so uh, that, that is where, at Radcliffe, where I experienced most of my criticism. Um, it was thought the teacher was the, uh, the puppeteer and I was the puppet. But I have to tell you that we were both very different people. She was terribly anxious and frustrated and always worrisome, terribly worried about money all the time. And I could have cared less. Um, but um, we did read each other's minds because we spent so much time together. But I thought that that came in handy when I was in college. Um, the, the, to give you an idea of what it was like to be there, there weren't very many, there, there weren't any blind people or deaf people at Radcliffe. And Braille had not been standardized yet. So um, there were lots of different Braille that you had to learn. Also, not very many books were in Braille to begin with. So the way that I studied was to have teacher read aloud and then I could read her lips and learn that way. Um, but the criticisms were also that I used the hearing sighted language. And first of all, let me tell you that I didn't realize that that was wrong. Um, but also, um, I'm sort of glad for that criticism because I might not have lived a life I did. Um, the hearing sighted language is the language that the hearing sighted know and understand. And so I feel it was just fine that I used the hearing sighted language. For instance, if I say that um, the roses are pink and the birds are chirping, um, I don't think that the hearing sighted people understand the, the feeling of pink or the quality of vibration when the birds are chirping. So I'm forced to use the hearing sighted language. And maybe what I hope for is that one day the hearing sighted will understand the deaf-blind language, but until that day, um, I must use the hearing sighted language. Um, I went on to uh, become a socialist, uh, a Bolshevik, a proponent of free love, um, even though I earned my way through the help of Mr. Andrew Carnegie, and we fought a lot, but. Um, we did get along. Um, I became the National and International Counselor for the Blind, and the reason I only worked for the blind instead of the deaf was because those institutions did not work together. Um, so that is why I worked for the blind. And um, I'm very pleased to speak with you today. Um, let me just part with this. Um, it is not blindness or deafness or dumbness, <coughs> which is a tragic condition. The tragic condition is boneheadedness. Thank you. <laughs>
Thank you, um, Helen. It's wonderful to uh, hear such a genteel rebel, isn't it? It's marvelous. Well, the next person is supposed to be uh, Dickie Chappelle, but I don't know. She's, she's always late, but she's not usually this late. And so um, I think we'll just have to uh, go right on past her. Oh, well, Dickie, there you are. And Helen was such a lady. And here she is, Dickie Chappelle, that just fresh back from Vietnam with another excuse. Look, okay, all right, come, come right up here. Come right up here, Dickie. Unless you want to use that mic. We're happier here. Please welcome Dickie Chappelle. service, covering stories in developing countries, uh, agricultural production. But when 56 rolled around and the Hungarians revolted, I knew that's where I had to be. I remembered my days on Iwo Jima and on Guam, and I was there in the fray. Um, I used to make forays across the Austrian-Hungarian Austrian border with James Michener. You know, I think we're going to see good things come from that guy. He's so pretty feisty. <laughs> yeah. um, we were out one night. I was out. James was uh, staying back in the safe zone, on the safe side of the Iron Curtain. And I got picked up by some Russian soldiers. I spent 50 days in a Hungarian prison. They nearly starved me to death. It's an experience I have a hard time talking about. I didn't know whether the consulate, the consular officer knew where I was. I didn't know whether I was going to get out. I didn't know whether I was going to get out alive. I did. I picked myself up and dusted myself off and went to the next fray. And that was in Algeria, when in 1957 I went out into the fields with the Algerian rebels and covered their story for life, National Geographic, Reader's Digest, anybody I could sell my stories to. They trusted me. They knew I hadn't ratted on anyone, on any of the Hungarian, you know, uh, rebels. Then in 58, I went to Cuba. I spent three weeks out in the fields with Fidel, following him around with my camera and my little notebook. And then in 61, I took my first assignment in Vietnam. I've spent a lot of time with the Marines. You know, I spent time with them during World War II. I spent time covering them in training on Panama during the war. So I like those boys. They taught me a lot. I'm the only woman who is certified to parachute in war zones with the Marines. Yeah, I'm a paratrooper. People say to me, they say, Dickie, don't you ever, aren't you ever afraid? And I say, hell yes, I'm afraid. But I've learned to control my fear, and I have my father to thank for that. You know, I said that there, maybe I haven't said this, there isn't much of anything good I can do. I mean, I grew up in a house of 12 people, most of them women, and they did everything for me. They cooked, they did the sewing. I have no domestic skills whatsoever. 
But my father used to take me out on construction sites with him. He was a salesman for these construction companies. And he'd say, okay, Dickie, let's go up and let's walk the roof line. Let's walk the ridge of this roof, you know. And I'd get up there and I'd walk and he'd say, and he'd say, Dickie, says, you're, you know you're not going to fall. Don't look down. Just look ahead. That's all you have to do. Look ahead. You're not going to fall and you're going to be okay. And you know something? I have remembered that. When I've been out on the bayonet borders of this world, I remember my father just saying, look ahead. When I jump out of that plane with that shoe on, I don't look down. I just look straight ahead. <laughs> you know, my, my parents sent me to MIT out of high school. I studied aeronautical engineering. I was really interested in flying. That's, that's, that was my real love. I wanted to be a flyer. I spent so much time at the airfield that, uh, frankly, I flunked out of school. Uh, I went home in ignominy, wasn't sure what I was going to do with my life, and I decided I went to the Curtis Wright Air Airfield in Milwaukee, where I was born and raised, and I said to the boys, I said, you know, I said, I'll cut a deal with you guys. I'll trade you typing services. I'm not a great typist, but you know, I, you know, I kind of dangled that out in front of them. I'll trade you typing services if you'll teach me how to fly. And they said, deal. So, I got my pilot's license. Now let me tell you about my flying. I got my license, I love to fly, but I'm farsighted. I have no depth perception, I can't tell speed, I can't tell, I have no height perception. I mean, I scared the bejesus out of these guys when I was up in the plane, you know, so <laughs> mostly I do my flying by myself. <laughs> uh, after that experience in Milwaukee, though I did land a job with TWA, I know a lot about planes, and I like planes, I've spent my life in the airfields. And so they gave me, gave me a job with their publicity department. And that's where I met Tony, my ex-husband. Now, Tony's the one who taught me how to take photographs. I have him to thank for any skills I have in that area. And uh, he taught me on a speed graphic. It weighed about 20 pounds. I used to tote that honker around with me. Um, but he taught me well. I went on from there to cover Marines training in Panama. And in between those times, writing books on aviation. Now, in between <coughs> jobs, I'd sit in this little walk-up apartment we had in New York. It was a real little rat's nest. And I'd churn out. I'd get up every morning, and I'd churn out 2,000 words a morning. One year, I wrote eight books on aviation. And I want to tell you, every time somebody's taking a shot at me out on the field, I'd say, well, Dickie, what would you rather do? Get up every morning and write 2,000 words or get out on the field? I'm going, oh, get me out in the field. You know? It's a lot easier than writing those 2,000 words. I wrote a book in 1962. It's called What's a Woman Doing Here? And if you haven't read it yet, you ought to. And if you haven't bought it yet, you ought to do that too, because I'd sure like to get out of that little ratty apartment I'm in, and that would help a whole lot. <laughs> I won the George Polk Award in 1962 for Best Overseas Journalist. I put a few bucks in my pocket. I was pretty happy about that. So I've done my tours of duty for in Vietnam. I'm on my fifth right now. There are days I don't have a good feeling about it, you know. Um, it's 1965, and I've been covering Vietnam for four years, and I've been walking out on um, point with the guys out in the field for four years, and there are days I don't know what it's going to be like when I get up in the morning, what's going to happen. But I always tell myself, it's better than sitting in that apartment, sure, and out those 2,000 words. So thanks. Thanks for being such a lovely audience, and I hope to see you again. Thank you, Dickie. Uh, she's what we call one tough cookie. Uh, but what a great, uh, what a great piece of advice. Don't look down. Um, I, she was intimating. She didn't tell you herself, but she did indeed uh, run into a landmine, and uh, so she died um, on the in action um, in, in Vietnam. 
The um, next guest is someone who has always been a hero of mine, maybe of many of us in, in the audience. Um, and uh, I think we sort of grew up with reading, reading uh, uh, about Samoa. What, what's the book? It's uh, teenage, no, what, no, no, what is growing, uh, growing, adolescence in Samoa. What is the name of the book? Coming of Age. Growing of age, coming of age in Samoa, something like that. Anyway, I'm very happy, even though I'm stumbling through my scholarship, and I obviously didn't do my research, to present to you, um, who was a person who was homeschooled, and so um, did have a very different approach to life. Please welcome Margaret Mead. Good afternoon, I'm real glad to be here with you today. Um, I'm basically what you'd call a cultural anthropologist. Um, no anthropologists don't study ants, by the way. We, we study human beings, although I've been asked that many times. Um, I had an early education. I was very fortunate to uh, learn my skill basically at a very young age. Uh, my father was an economist. He uh, taught at uh, University in Pennsylvania, and my grandmother, my paternal grandmother, was a, a school teacher, and uh, my mother was a sociologist. I had homeschooling, as you said, um, until I reached high school age. Um, my grandmother set me to work at a very young age observing things, observing the patterns in leaves, observing um, the linguistic differences between my sister and I, um, observing the differences in our clothing and our play, and she'd make me write these observations down in a little notebook. So um, when um, I finally uh, grew up and went to college, I had a lot of those observational skills. In fact, um, the kinds of experiences that college students have, I generally had them by about the age of five. <laughs> so, uh, I studied psychology. I was very interested in, in uh, the ways people thought and uh, the ways people behaved. And I took a class in uh, anthropology and uh, decided uh, later that that was going to be my field. I did get a master's in psychology, but I took my doctorate degree in anthropology. I was fortunate also to have a very famous professor instruct me, Franz Boas and his assistant. Uh, Ruth Benedict were both instructors of mine. Ruth and I later became very intimate friends. Um, when it was time for me to do my field work, my ethnography, my very first ethnography, I wanted to go overseas. I wanted to go to one of the Pacific Islands, study some very primitive society. I wanted to make comparisons between a primitive society and my own because I have always been interested in the youth and I was very concerned about the problems that teenagers seem to experience, the conflicts that they have through their teen years. And I have, I have heard often that um, that's just nature, that everyone when they become a teenager will go through these years of stress and conflict. And I wanted to double check that one and see if that was really true. And I thought if I could find one society where teenagers had a relaxing time, did not live those years of conflict, then maybe that wasn't a biological determinant. Well, Dr. Boas did not like the idea of my going overseas. I was 23 years old, I was a woman, he wanted me to stay here in the States and study a Native Indian group where I'd be safe. And we argued about it. And he finally compromised with me. And he told me if I could find an island where a ship would come in on a regular basis every three weeks, I could go. And I found Samoa. And so that's where I did my first ethnography. 
And as you said, I later wrote a book, Coming of Age in Samoa. And it was in Samoa where I did find young teenage girls and boys who had a rather relaxing transition into adulthood. I later went back to the islands, worked in New Guinea, off and on for several years. And that's pretty much how I spent the first third of my career. World War II came along, and I decided I needed to get involved in American society. I needed to help the American people adapt to the changes that were going to take place, to be ready for war, <coughs> to be cooperative, and so I began doing psychological studies on Americans to help them understand who they are. And uh, I enjoyed that, and I learned a lot about myself while I went through that process. In 1945, I began to write a sequel to Keep Your Powder Dry. That was the book on American character. And uh, then the bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and, and I thought, here we are, people who not only can kill our enemies and ourselves and every bystander around, how can I relate something I said a week ago to something that enormous? And I tore the manuscript up. And then I spent a lot of time, the next third of my career, helping cultures adapt to rapid change because so many of those primitive societies were undergoing rapid change after World War II. I became basically a cultural broker and I began to train my students in cultural brokerage and that is helping people understand where they are and where they need to go and how they might adapt to all the new influences coming down upon them, creating so much cultural change. And I spent the last third of my career back with my own people, back with the youth that I love so much, helping them understand the changes that they were going to have to adapt to and helping their parents understand that it is the youth who are the most adaptable to change, and that it's them that we need to focus on. I guess I became a self-appointed scientist because I began using television, radio, the press, everything I could to get the word out to the American public. Um, I, was, I had to take a stand about Vietnam. I, made the term, the uh, generation gap, popular. I became pretty popular among young people, I suppose. They called me the grandmother of everybody. <laughs> and uh, someone once asked me, what would you like on your epitaph? And I said, well, I suppose I'd like for it to say, she lived long enough to do some good. Thank you very much. Um, our next uh, guest is someone who uh, is closer to home. Um, she, uh, I think you, you know her from, from local history uh, in the Silver Valley and in Spokane and her impact uh, upon the political life of, of women in, in Idaho. So. Uh, May I present uh, May Alkwright Hutton.
friends. Well, I listened to the miners and their talk of addiction. I had dreams of my own. Now, I had friends who uh, prospected the Bunker and Sullivan Mines, Noah Kellogg, Con Sullivan, and um, or Rourke, Phil O'Rourke. Well, when they struck it rich, they decided to sell off their shares to the wealthy corporate mine owners. No longer were the miners of the Silver Valley working uh, for friends who didn't know them, who didn't care to know about them. And in 1887, when the price of silver to gold fell, there were 1,400 miners put out of work in the dead of winter. Labor all over our country was suffering, and so was the economy. Well, the Bunker Hill was no exception. So they decided that what they would do is close and then reopen those mines in order to uh, get the non-union miners for lower wages. Well, the, the union miners were just furious. So they decided they would hold a of their own and make plans for retaliation. Now, my husband, Al Hutton, was an engineer on a locomotive, and his route was from Burke Canyon to Burke. And on April 29, 1899, he went to work in the normal way. And when he got there, his fireman had his locomotive all steamed up, and he loaded on and chugged on up the Burke Canyon. And when he got up to Burke, the place was swarming with men. And this was a little unusual. And the conductor said, these men are going to be passengers on your train today. Well, now he knew that something was up because this was highly unusual. At that time, he felt a gun in his back. And he said, do what you're told. Well, he was going to do what he was told already. So they headed down the track to Jem, which is just down the tracks from Burke. And there at the Frisco Concentrator, they loaded on more men, but they also loaded on 3,000 pounds of dynamite and powder. <coughs> well, Al knew something was up at that point, but he was told to keep heading down the tracks toward Wardner, and they stopped every half mile or so and picked up more men. By this time, it had been dubbed the Dynamite Express, and well so, because when they got to Wardner, most of the men jumped off, went up to the, the mines to get those non-union miners out of there. But the rest of them, headed up by Harry Orchard, took the powder and dynamite and went to the bunker concentrator. They put the powder underneath those pilings and they blew it to matchwood. Now this was one of the largest concentrators in North America and there was nothing left. Oh, it was quite a sight, let me tell you. Well, President McKinley decided that this was insurrection and he declared martial law in Shoshone County. Every man who carried a union card was arrested and placed in bullpens, which are mucky, dirty barns, and they're surrounded by wire fences, guarded, and, and there's cold and dank, and the conditions were just deplorable. Well, the only way that they could get out was if they signed a written sworn statement that they had nothing to do with the riots of April 29th, and that they, uh, uh, that they did not support the unions, and that the unions were solely responsible for inciting and perpetrating the events of April 29th. Well, not one man would sign. And I started a series of letter writing. I wrote to every paper, every magazine. I wrote to the president, I wrote to the governor. I would write to anyone who would listen because it had to be published and the story had to be told about the deplorable conditions of labor, especially for minors. Well, I started to visit the bullpens and uh, my language could be a little colorful and hanging around miners for so long. And I would come up to the gates and I would throw insults at the guards and they would throw them back. Well, pretty soon mayhem ensued and thus satisfied, I would throw a comment over my shoulder as I was leaving only to return the next day to do it again. Well, now I realize here that Al and I had no idea about the goings on and Al was arrested on May 29th and placed in those bullpens. I was furious, I was incensed. So my letter writing became much more vigorous, let me tell you. And so did my visits to the bullpen. Well, two weeks later, Al was released. No charges made and none pending. And soon after, the miners were released as well. Oh, that was a glorious day for labor, let me tell you. I decided to write a book about the events. I decided in my book that I would write about the greedy mine owners and how poorly the miners were treated. 
It was a grand book, if I say so, but my critics say that it was somewhat fictitious, that I changed the events. Um, now, I did use actual pictures and actual dates. You might be able to, to tell who I was talking about, even though I did change the names, but that's beside the point. I published the book myself, and there had to be at least 25,000 copies out there. Well, I'm told that my time is short now, and I need to stop this story, but there is plenty more, and someday I will tell you more. I appreciate how you've listened so well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mary. Um, we also, she didn't have time to talk to us about her uh, work getting the, the right to vote for women in Idaho, but thank you for the right to vote. And she also didn't talk about her clothes, you know, she was supposed to be very flamboyant, so uh, she should come back another time. Well, our, our last guest is someone very, very special. Uh, you heard about her uh, from Martin Luther King uh, earlier in the day, and um, I think we all know how important uh, this woman was to the civil rights movement. And please welcome Rose Marks. Welcome. Here and I'm just learning so much. Oh goodness, I, I just don't know how to start telling you all my story. But I'll start with this. If it had not been for me being in such a rush that day, I would have never gotten on that bus. <laughs> but I was in a hurry because I had been to work. As you see, I've been Christmas shopping and I had lots to do as the secretary for the NAACP. I had an election coming up, I had a workshop going, and so when I got to the bus, all I did was I put the money in and I just kept walking down that aisle. And I walked until I got to the middle of the bus where there was one seat left. You see, the first 10 rows of that bus were reserved for the white people and the back 10 rows were reserved for the black people. So as I counted off my rows, I got to the 11th one, and there was that seat. And so, I sat down. I was tired, I was relaxing. And then all of a sudden, I looked up, and the white section was filling up, and then it was full. There was one white man left, and the bus driver said, y'all niggas better give up that seat. Well, <laughs> we just sat there. I then knew who that man was. He was the same man that had thrown me off that bus 12 years ago in 1943. The next thing I heard was him saying, y'all better make it light on y'all selves and get on up. Well, we knew that meant trouble. At least I didn't. Everybody started getting up. And I thought about it, but then I just scooted closer to the window. You see, I was tired, but I wasn't tired the way that you've heard about in the books, where I was tired from work and the shopping and all the things that was going on. No, I was tired of giving in. You see, I have seen my family face discrimination all of my life. I had grown up with parents that sought the ideal community by moving to Tuskegee, Alabama, where there was supposed to be great working relations between blacks and whites, but it wasn't. And soon my father left us and my mother moved back in with my grandparents. My grandparents had faced discrimination because of the color of their skin. They were just as white as just about everybody in this room because of their heritage. And because of that, they were sometimes beaten, 
harassed, and discriminated against by the white people. My grandfather told us, and he instilled in all of his children and his grandchildren, you will not bow down to anybody, and you will be educated. And so we were. We all went to school. My mother was a school teacher, and she taught me until she was 11 years old. Then she sent me to a private school to learn more about what I needed to learn to go on in life. But by 11th grade, suddenly my grandmother fell ill, and I had to go back and to start helping her, and then she died. I didn't go back to school after that until after I married Raymond Parks. Raymond Parks was a fine man, fine man that was an opposite of me. He was the outgoing man and I was the shy one. And he pursued me and finally, as you see, I gave him. <laughs> he taught me about racial incidents that had been going on and how to be an activist. He was involved with the Scottsboro Boys and trying from the start of the trial to get them freed. And finally, after much work, as you all know in this room, they finally were freed after many years. He followed that up with trying to get voter registration started. And that's when I started getting involved in things. Voter registration. He said, I'm not going to play those games that they want us to play just to get to vote but I decided I was. And so I decided in 1943 to try to get to vote. And by 1945, I won that game, and I began my voting experience. During the 1940s, blacks were a more compliant. Things were just, we'll take what you're giving us. But in the 1950s, things began to change. Everybody was tired. We were tired of everything that had been going on. The buses were terrible places for us. Don't you know that we had to put our money in the front of the bus and then <coughs> walk to the back of the bus? And by the time we got to the back of the bus, they'd be zooming off. And it was even reported in Montgomery, Alabama, that one time one black woman had her hand in that door, and all of a sudden the man cut the, put the doors together, closed them together, and then dragged her all the way to the next bus stop. We were tired. And so we began to start thinking of what we could do. As the secretary of the NAACP, my job was to document all of the things that were going on in the state of Alabama, from discriminatory to violence to unjust acts. It was an overwhelming experience, the things that people would tell us about. But I did it anyway. And then came in 1955, December 1st, that fateful day. As I told you, I was sitting there. I had moved up closer to that window. The man said to me, are you going to get up? I calmly said, no. He said, then you're going to get arrested. And I said, Okay. And that was all I said. The police came. They took me away, handcuffing me. And the only thing I said to them was, why do you all punish us so much? And that was it. You see, they call me the mother of the civil rights movement. Because of that one act, I was able to start what was then called the Montgomery Bus Boycott that led to desegregation for the buses. Many people were, had their homes bombed during that time. Many people had many experiences that were terrible for them. But in the end, it was all worth it. When I look back at the things that I've experienced in my life now, I'm having to live in Detroit because right after that bus boycott, my life was threatened and we had to get out of town. I opened up in 1987.
the Rosa and Raymond Institute for Self-Development. And from 1965 to 1988, I spent my time working with Congressman John Conyers, working for people that were um, homeless and helping them get the resources that they made. I've been honored so many times and I've met so many people. But the greatest honor I could have done was to sit in that chair and to say, equality and justice is for everyone. Well, that was very special, thank you. And uh, this is not an assemblage of very strong uh, women. I think we probably could say they're all, uh, no matter uh, beneath the skin, pretty tough cookies, and uh, uh, how many of you would like to um, start asking them questions? Okay, what's your question? Um, Lula, Amy, what is Which, uh, for, for Bessie Coleman? Um, when you said the um, African that got kicked out, what is, you said like um, pre-ex something? The gentleman who was excommunicated, or yeah. expatriated? Yeah. Um, during that period of time, a lot of blacks, because of what was going on in the teens and 20s, um, left. So for example, um, as I mentioned, I uh, knew Al Capone. There were a lot of speakeasies and clubs in Chicago during that period of time, and a lot of them were owned by the gangsters. The Jim Crow laws were in effect at that period, and the gangsters were the only ones that would allow blacks into their establishments. And a lot of blacks left the country during that period of time, uh, including Josephine Baker and Eugene Bullard, who was the pilot that I mentioned. A lot of blacks left because in Europe, they were not being discriminated against. And so that's what was going on. Next question. Yes. Um, Helen Keller, I know that you were a lecturer in your life. How was that done? Was that done through your did have an interpreter who spoke for me most of the time because my voice was not something that anybody would really want to listen to for very long periods of time. Um, it was very uneven and um, I had a hard time pronouncing words. So for the most part, I did have somebody speaking for me. Did you sign? Did I sign? I would sign to the interpreter, yes. Well, um, I really wanted to speak, and I wanted to speak well, but that never did happen. Um, I practiced all the time. I had many voice lessons, um, and it just, I never did sound very well to other people, and that was extremely disappointing for me. I became very depressed about that particular aspect. Um, next question, yes. I have a question for uh, Margaret. Margaret. Why she carries the stick? <laughs> oh, <laughs> good question. Can you repeat the questions on yeah, Oh, yes. Uh, the question was to Margaret, why does she carry a stick? Well, I, I'm not sure anymore. I've been carrying it so long to tell you the truth. <laughs> Sort of a security blanket, I suppose. Something for me to lean on. It's just become a trademark. I think I cut someone off right here. Was there a question? Yeah, go ahead. I just wanted to ask the percentage that Tom Keller was considered deaf. I'm sorry? And the percentage wise, like 80 percent or 90%. Oh, right. Helen, did you hear that? The question is, what percentage of deafness did Helen Keller have? It, it was, I was entirely deaf, entirely blind. Yes, uh, back there. I have a question to Margaret. Did she have kids? To Margaret, the question to Margaret is, did she have kids? Yes, dear, I had a little girl. Is this on? There you go. I had a little girl. Mary Catherine is her name. She's a grown-up girl now. She's also an anthropologist. I think Margaret had three husbands. 
But just one time through, too. One time. <laughs> yes, the, the boy in the red jacket and then the woman behind him after that? Miss um, Rosa Parks, are you still very much alive? I am still very much alive living in Detroit. <laughs> and I have to tell you that my granddaughter, who was five at the time, called me up to tell me that she had the honor to meet Rosa Parks, and she was thrilled to death. She said, she said she's a very spry, spry person. <laughs> yes, very good. Then your question? I have two questions. I'd like to know the name of the book that May Arkwright Hutton wrote, but first, I'd like to ask Rosa Parks. I thought I understood this morning from Martin Luther King Jr. that that they had set her up, because he said, we thought she'd be the one. Was that, did that happen accidentally, Rosa, or did they in fact, because you were the secretary of the NAACP. Let me repeat the question. The question to Rosa is, uh, was she set up and had she been selected beforehand, or uh, uh, what was the sequence of events there, Rosa? To answer your question, there had been two other women that had been arrested on the buses, and it had been thought each time that that would be a test case. When it happened for me, no, I had no kind of um, knowledge or any thought about it, or I would have just left the whole thing. I didn't want, I'm not a public person, I don't like to be thrust into the public like that. It was honestly that at that point, through my life, we've had so many struggles, that I was really just tired. The question is, the name. what is the name of May Arkwright Hutton's book? The name of my book is The Coeur d'Alene's or The Tale of the Modern Inquisition. However, you will be hard pressed to find the book because I did go about trying to retrieve my book when I became a wealthy mine owner myself. Uh, since it did point to those people that I so deplored, I decided to go around Bay Borough and I also steal the books off of people's private libraries and still down my blouse and I went to part with them. Yes, Rosa? May I also add that the reason why everyone said that I was the one was because for the other two people, they had maybe some tarnishes to their reputations. There was something that would not make them a good test case, where for me, I was held in such high esteem in the white and the black community that when I was seen at the courthouse, people were yelling out, you picked on the wrong one now. <laughs> uh, I think we have time for a couple more questions. One back here. Rosa, okay, did you hear? Yes. Would you repeat the question, Rosa? I didn't quite catch it. What do you think of gangster rap? Well, as I told you in my presentation, I'm very supportive of youth issues because that is what the Rosa and Raymond Parks um, Institute is about, helping youth. And I know that's a modern um, music. But I also know that, and it saddens me with all of the, the, the things of violence and hatred that are going on amongst youth as well. And so I would think, as the Rosa Parks character, that I would maybe support some parts of the gangster rap, but then really not like others. Um, one of the things that has happened to Rosa in the 90s has been that actually she had some youth break into her home and beat her up. And they didn't know who she was. So I think at some point supporting the youth with the kinds of things that they are um, listening to, but then also not supporting the violent aspects of it and the hatred. We have one last, one last question right here. Uh, the question to Helen Keller is, how did she get sick? I had a, what they called brain fever, which they now believe was uh, rubella, a uh, form of the German measles. Uh, there was an epidemic of it in Alabama. And they believe that that's what made her so sick. And if you get take your shots, get immunized, uh, you <laughs> won't have to worry about rubella. There are a number of things that improvements have been made. I think the time has come for us to ask our guests to, uh, to uh, tell us who they really are, why they chose their, uh, the person that they pro portrayed, and what they have uh, gained from it, what, how it has changed their lives in any way. Let's start here with Margaret and go around. 
And my name is Marion Ackerman, and I'm an instructor of anthropology here at North Idaho College. And of course, um, I've always been interested in, in uh, Margaret's um, life, and I wanted to learn a little bit more about her, and um, I just thought it would be an awful lot of fun. I, I just admired her so much to be able to play her character. Hey. My name is Sherry Bates. I'm Human Resource Manager at North Idaho College. And I chose May Arkwright Hutton partly because she's such a strong labor advocate. It's not something we're allowed to do in human resources is to advocate for her. <laughs> so this is my chance. Uh, but also she, she's a very fine person in that the Hutton Settlement is named after she and her husband Al in Spokane. And uh, she was made an orphan basically at the age of 10 as well as Al was an orphan. And uh, that just is very dear to my heart, that they helped so many orphan children in that early period of our history. And Helen. I'm Andrea Carter. I teach English here at um, NIC. And uh, I've always heard the, you know, the stereotypes of Helen Keller. And so I wanted to learn more about who she was as an individual. And she was extremely radical, um, which is, of course, never printed about her because um, that would get in the way of this pristine, chaste, uh, innocent woman, and she was nothing like that at all. Um, and it was, it was really great to find that out, so thank you. <laughs> and Dickie. Uh, <laughs> I'm Dickie Chappelle. Actually, I'm Denise Clark. I'm a librarian here at North Idaho College. Oh, I'm dying to smoke this cigarette, by the way, so <laughs> you know, in case you're wondering why I'm just hanging on to it so tightly. Um, I chose Dickie Chappelle because I assume probably most of you have never heard of her, and I would like you to learn a little more about her. Maybe I've intrigued you enough to go look in an encyclopedia and read a little bit about her. I, I chose Dickie because in 1962, I was in junior high, in this little uh, Midwestern uh, farming community of Ionia, working in the local public library after school. And the librarian had ordered a copy of What's a Woman Doing Here? And I checked it out, and I read it, and I learned something. In 1962, that I didn't have to be a teacher if I didn't want to be one. I didn't have to be a nurse. I didn't have to be a secretary. Heck, I didn't even have to be a librarian if I didn't want to be one. I could get in a plane, I could parachute, I could cover wars, I could do something like that. Here was a woman who had opened up a whole new world of possibilities for me. I wanted to revisit that book. I haven't read that book since 1962. So, of course, I checked it. I, I got a copy, I checked it out, and I read it. And I remembered that young 13, 14-year-old with that book, and it brought back all kinds of very precious memories. It's not as well written as I remember it. Uh, um, Dickie was not a great writer or photographer, but she certainly was a remarkable woman. And so I, I thank everyone for allowing me this experience of revisiting one of my early heroines. <laughs> And, and uh, Bessie, I think you and Dickie should have known each other. It's a, you know, these daring, daring women who were flying planes before, almost before planes were invented. Tell us about you. Uh, my name is Amelia Phillips. I was an instructor here at NIC for about five years. And for the last year and a half, I've been over at Spokane Falls Community College. Um, I chose Bessie because she wanted to fly. The one thing in my life I've always wanted to do is be an astronaut. And when I look at her determination, it's like, well, gee, maybe I still have a chance to go and do this. Um, I was absolutely fascinated with some of the things that she had to put up with, living in Chicago with the Jim Crow laws, going through the Chicago race riots of 1919, actually hanging out in speakeasies with gangsters. I mean, it's just incredible when you hear this stuff. And then to go to a foreign country just to get your pilot's license. And some of the really gutsy things that she did just fascinated me. And there's just way too much information about her to tell you in eight minutes. So please go out and read some books about her. And, 
And thank you, Amelia, for keeping your loyalty to NIC, even though she's working now in Spokane. Thank you for coming back again, and we always like to see you. Rosa. Well, I'm Beverly walker Garfia, and I'm a counselor at Spokane Community College. And about three weeks ago, I got an email uh, from Amelia that said, help, we need a Rosa Parks, that person has pulled out. And then I got a phone call after that, like five minutes later, that said, uh, Beverly, did you get the email? <laughs> and, and so I felt compelled to support my sister up here. <laughs> At that point, I really only knew about Rosa Parks, that she sat on the bus and didn't move. That was basically all I knew about her. And it's just been a fantastic experience to do all of the research and to learn and to figure out kind of why she did and how she got to that point in 1955. So I really appreciated this. So, yes. We certainly appreciate the time and everything else that you have put in. It's been a remarkable panel, been a remarkable day. Let me just remind you, the music starts tomorrow at 1045 and Franklin D. Roosevelt will be portrayed by Christopher Carlson tomorrow at 11. Thank you one and all, and uh, uh, we certainly thank Tony Stewart and the committee for giving us another day with our journey through time. Thank you.